chapter 5. So we enter the last chapter of this epistle. It's not very long. But today we're looking only at the first five verses. The first five verses. Asking the question, who overcomes the world? Who overcomes the world? Listen to the Word of God. 1 John 5, verse 1. This is in the NIV. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God. By loving God and carrying out His commands. This is love for God. To obey His commands. And His commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 1 John 5, 1 through 5. But the overlying theme here is the victory that God's people experience. And we're going to kind of walk through this. Now, we've uh, two things have come out in uh, John's Bible. It's in the Gospel and as well as the Epistles. One, of course, believe that the Lord Jesus is the Christ. That's repeated over and over again. And we, we find it uh, again in this message today. Believe and obey. And so the, when he talks about obeying the commands, he, I think John is referring directly to obeying the command to believe the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. And the command is connected to it, which has to do with Keeping the commands by loving one another the way Christ has loved us. Basically, that's what He's done with the commands. And so I think in the Gospel of John and 1 John, when He says in this passage, it's not burdensome, and we'll get there in just a minute, it's not burdensome. I think when we, when we look back at the law of Moses and all of the regulations that were related to that, Thank God that Jesus came and fulfilled the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. He did not come to destroy it. He came to fulfill it. He didn't set it aside. He completed it. And so in that respect, these commands to believe that the Lord Jesus is the Son of God and to love one another are not burdensome. They're not burdensome. They bring liberty and freedom to us. And so we're going to look in this passage related to that, to the victory that takes place through a spiritual birth. He goes over that again. We, we looked at the spiritual birth in John 3, and uh, where Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born of uh, spirit, and you, you must be born of, uh, he mentioned water, the cleansing that takes place when we're born again. And uh, he's, he's uh, mentioned, you must, do not be amazed, do not be surprised at this, you must be born again. So Jesus was hitting with Nicodemus, the, this great religious leader, that he had to have a change of life, a new birth that only God could give him. It wasn't a matter of him keeping the laws of Moses. It was a matter of receiving God's Spirit and having a changed life, something only God could do in his life. He must be born again. And John had told us it's not of human descent. It's not natural. It's not a natural birth. Even though I think in John 3, he referred to that. Being born of flesh, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born naturally is natural. Okay? That which is born of spirit is is spirit. That which is born of spirit is supernatural. Something only God can do. And so we're, we're at that. This birth he's referring to, he says, 
we must be born of God. So the victory that's going to come is through a spiritual birth. Otherwise, there's not really a victory. Okay? And this victory produces a birthright it, because of our spiritual birth. There is an inheritance for the saints. Paul especially talks about that, but it's referred to all throughout the New Testament. The inheritance that comes to the saints is based on being born again. We inherit a place in heaven. We do not earn it by good works. We inherit it because of our birthright. When we are born again, rightfully we are given that inheritance. And that it, it's placed in our names placed on that list of those that will inherit okay, that kingdom. And that's the good news of it. And I think just uh, for the sake of the First point, the victory takes place through a spiritual birth or being born again. If you're here today and you've never been born again, you've never had a spiritual birth, I want to encourage you to call on the name of the Lord. Believe the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done for you. He died for you. The Son of God has died for your sin. Your sin. And He died so that you could have new life, a new birth. And so if you've never received that or you don't know what it means, you can talk to us after the service. We'll be glad to talk with you about it, to pray with you about the new birth. <coughs> this leads to victory. The new birth, in, in a true sense, the new birth is victory. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's go to the second. <coughs> the victory takes place by loving God. In our passage, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ in verse 1, is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves His child as well. So how our love of God's people is a reflection of our love for God. We don't love God's people in order to be loved by God. We love God's people because we are God's child. We've been born again. The result of truly loving the Father is to love God's people. This goes over and over and over again in John's writings. He just keeps on talking about it. He's like the apostle of love. And um, he, he just keeps talking about it in different places in his writings. Because loving God, just like Jesus said, we take all the commands, what's the greatest? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself as the second. It's almost just like the first. And that's how Jesus taught. That this victory takes place by love. The kingdom of God is ruled by a different principle than the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of this world is ruled by principle of get, get ahead, survive, those kind of principles of success. And those principles can be taught, can be learned, the kingdom principle of loving God and loving others is something that comes from God. It's supernatural. That's what makes God's people and God's church really different in this world. Because it's this is a different principle. They can't just we can't just happen to be there. It comes by God's Spirit. Loving obedience leads us to love God's people. And there it is. 1 John 3:23. Go back a chap uh, two chapters. 3.23 This is the command. Believe the name of, the, of His Son in the name of His Son Jesus Christ and love one another as He commanded us. So there's the command. And then in chapter 5, verse 2, this is how we know that we love the children of God. By loving God and carrying out His commands. This is normal result of loving God. Loving God transforms the life. Thirdly, a victory for the Christian life through love and obedience. Interesting. Through love and obedience. Here's what it means to love God is to believe Jesus. You want to know how can I love God? Well, some people might think loving God is going to church. That's not what the Scripture teaches. Somebody might think loving God is being a good husband. 
That's not what the Scripture is teaching. Somebody may think loving God is giving money to the poor. That's not what the Bible teaches. These are results of loving God. That is not what loving God is. The Bible is clear about it, I think, and what it means to love God. One, we cannot love God unless we believe Jesus is the Son of God. Because that's the way to know God. We cannot love God unless that Spirit of God, God's Spirit then is put in our heart. His love then is dispersed within us. And then through us His love is expressed. It will be expressed. It will be expressed. We cannot force the love of God. It, the love of God is not a legal religious work. It is not something that we do because we want to show God that we're loving Him. No, it's something we do because He's put it in our heart. He's put it in our heart to do this. It's really different when you think about religion. Religion practices, makes practice, and I keep saying this because we need to know this. Religion's practice is to earn merit to earn something from whoever God is. That's religious practice. That is not what the Bible teaches. And it's not what John is teaching here. Evidence is normally obvious. Normally obvious. Not, probably not always definitely. But normally obvious. Jesus said, uh, uh, let's see, this is number three. So let me get it here. The evidence for knowing God, okay, is going to be clear. Remember we talked about how the Spirit of God bears witness in our spirit that we are God's children. I keep coming up back to that because it's all connected here. The Spirit of God bears witness. You say, how do you know you're a child of God? Well, God lets us know that. When we believe Jesus and we embrace the Gospel, and, and uh, we turn from our sins and turn to Jesus Christ as the only way, the only hope, the only way of salvation, then God's Spirit comes to live in us. God's Spirit gives witness that we belong to the Lord. Evidence is normally obvious. God's people then, because God by His Spirit disperses gifts, various gifts in the hearts and lives of of God's people. This is also supernatural. It's not a talent. A talent could be something a person is born with, but not a gift. A gift is just that. It's a gift. When we say salvation is a gift, the motivate, motivating factor of the Christian life is also a gift. God's Spirit comes to live in us, and He grants certain gifts that we would live in the kingdom and live for the Lord uh, in this life. You with me? I hope so. Let's go to four. Okay. This victory is not a burden. It's not a burden. Your Christian walk should not be burdensome. There should be a sense of liberty. A sense of freedom. When I came to Christ, the burden was lifted. Spiritually speaking. Off of my, I could not explain it. It was lifted when I came to Christ because our victory in Christ should not be burdensome. Jesus taught me, said, uh, victory is laying down our burdens at the feet of Jesus. It's coming to Jesus to give Him our burdens and leaving them with Him. This we do all throughout the Christian life. But our relationship with God should not be burdensome. Okay, Jesus said this. Turn over to Matthew 11. Matthew 11. I want to show you this. You have 11, 28 to 30. Somebody read that. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is really a different message from the Pharisee message. It's really different. And it's really different from uh, any religious teaching that you will be encounter anywhere. Jesus says, come to me. So he becomes the source of this freedom and this victory. Come to him. We cannot expect to have this victory and freedom unless we come to him. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. The world produces weariness and burdens. Now, as a Christian, that doesn't mean we never get tired. Even Jesus sat down by the well, right? Even Jesus sat down by the well. So it's not that. We know it doesn't mean that. We never get tired. He says, Come, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. And he actually explains it later. He says, I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. He explains it, see. So he's not talking about we never get tired. That's a normal, natural thing. But he is talking about finding rest spiritually, rest for our souls, which can only be found by coming to Jesus. Come to me, he said. I will give. It's a gift. I will give you this rest that your souls need. Why? Because I'm humble. He says, I'm gentle. I'm humble in heart. You will find rest. My yoke, even the yoke, even the commitment, even the sense of, of being surrendered to the Lord, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Now, some of those he was talking with would find their way later into a prison because they were following Jesus. Some of those he was talking with probably would find their way later in suffering for the gospel. So what does it mean? It must not mean, come to me and you will never go to prison. So it doesn't mean that. 